original, super fun, and all about artisan cheese and more to melt your peaceful heart and toast your peaceful life. Coming to you from the Appalachian Mountains of southwestern Virginia, this is the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hey, this is Scott Hall from Peaceful Heart Farm, and you are listening to the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hello, 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 everybody. Melanie Hall here. I hope you're doing well. The conversation today and every day revolves around the value of tradition, traditional life, traditional food prep and storage, traditional cooking, and of course, traditional artisan cheese. Topics discussed here are designed to create new perspectives and possibilities for how you might add the taste of tradition to your life. It has been a wild and crazy few days, and um, there are more days to come. Uh, Today's podcast uh, will be a little bit shorter. We do not have internet and won't have it for five more days, for a total of eight days. If you're new, welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I hope you'll engage and comment as we go along. And as always, welcome back to the veteran, traditional, homestead-loving regulars who stop by the Farmcast every week. I appreciate you all so much. I have so much to share about the farm this week that it is the topic of the day. Today's recipe is MIA, missing in action, for reasons I will detail later. So I wanted to start out with the ordinary, the usual, the animals, the garden, the orchard, the creamery, and uh, the cheese making. I wanted to speak in general terms and fill in details later in the main body of this podcast. However, I really can't uh, um, even cover it in general terms without the overlay of, of the wake of the storm we had three days ago, four days ago. I'm losing track of time. It's coloring everything at the moment and will continue to do so for quite a while into the future. We're safe here. The home is safe. No problems there. But I'll start by describing the storm and the initial damage and uh, how it affected the animals. And then also I'll talk about just in general the animals, the orchard, the creamery and the, the cheese making, the herd shares, the quail and so on. So the storm, it was late afternoon on Tuesday, and it was the second day of several days of predicted storms. Um, It was upon us a couple of hours before the evening milking, and the wind picked up and the trees were whipped about like twigs. It was strong. It was sudden. Um, The rain began to pelt down in sheets, and I don't know if I've ever seen it rain so hard. Well, perhaps some of the rains in Florida could match it. Um, Anyone driving would have to pull over. There was no way to see even a few feet in front of you. It was sheeting down so hard. Um, And the torrent of rain and small hail, it went on for quite a while. So we were late getting started with evening milking, waiting for it to lighten up. And and, uh, even so, it was still raining steadily as we proceeded with the evening. But we didn't get far. Let me talk about evening milking plan A. Um, There are two directions to bring the cows up to the milking shed. Scott created what he calls a travel lane in several places around the farm. So it runs along the edge of the fields. It runs along the edge of the front fields um, into a wooded area. And from there, we can get the animals across the driveway with a nifty gate set up that makes a path across the driveway. And then that travel lane proceeds down the side of the two fields on the other side. So so they have their travel lane. And then it goes past the creamery, which is in progress, all the way down to the milking shed. Now that lane also continues on past that entrance into the milking shed, past the orchard and across the creek bottom, to the fields in the back so the cows can get to the milking shed and later the milking barn when it's finished from either direction they can come down uh, from where they are right now or they can come up from the back fields Um, so as far as milking scott's first task is to get the milking shed set up for the cows he tests the milking machine gets their feed uh, supplements ready um, 
I don't, I don't know all the little things he does in there. Then he comes down the travel lane, and ideally, he meets me in the middle. And ideally means that I have finished my first task of feeding Lambert. Um, he's just two months old, and he gets a bottle in the morning and in the evening. And um, hopefully, I've finished feeding him and gotten the cows to the driveway crossing. At the very least, I would have them moving in the right direction. Scott joins me. He takes butter with a lead rope, and then I bring along the rest of the motley crew behind butter always gets milked first and she leads the others don't lead you just kind of heard them now for my task i head straight up the driveway scott goes to the milking shed but i head straight up the driveway to where the gates can be opened across the driveway it's the quickest route to the front pastures where all of the animals are currently residing and so this particular evening i ran into the first problem a very large tree was in directly in front of me across the driveway. It was over a foot in, di- in diameter. Probably it was about a foot in diameter, I think, right in front of me. But at the base, it was more than a foot in diameter. And the top branches were all the way across the driveway, laying on top of the tool shed just to my left. Um, and I checked briefly, but I couldn't tell if the roof was damaged. And it, it wasn't. Um my biggest concern was, at this point, was that not only could I not get to the gates to open them across the driveway, that tree was laying directly across the travel lane to my right. I would get the cows across the driveway, sure, but not very far up the lane. So I yelled for Scott. <laughs> and uh, so he comes up from the milking shed to assess the situation and he immediately takes off for the chainsaw. Um, I circled, meanwhile, I'm circling, I circle around behind the shed and I went out to the pasture to feed Lambert and, and to bring the cows up. And I was hoping uh, that Scott would maybe have a path cleared by then. But I mean, realistically, it was going to take a little while to get that tree cut up enough to get the cows through. So, um, you know, chin up, let's get ready. Anyway, I wanted, that was my thought, get, get the, uh, get the cows up to the, uh, up to the crossing anyway. So, uh, let's talk about how we got to plan B. Um, it was still raining, not heavily at this point, but steady, just a steady rain, kind of a steady light to medium rain. And um, as I brought the cows up, I could hear Scott with the chainsaw, and I could see he was working on the upper part of the tree first. I mean, that was the part that was across the driveway, and that made sense. You know, get the smaller part done, you know, basically working from most almost at the top down. However, I could also tell that the chainsaw was giving him some issues. It, it wouldn't stay running. Um, you know, he persevered. He got the tree there cut up into three or four pieces there on the driveway side. And um, he just kind of left him laying there and moved into the travel lane. And the plan was to cut the part in the travel lane into a few pieces also. And then just roll them aside um, just enough out of the way to get the cows through. And then all of the debris could be removed from the driveway and from the travel lane, like, tomorrow. Um, But the chainsaw really started acting up at that point. And um, so the tree originated in the field to the left there, and it was pushed over with the roots sticking up in the air. Um, And the part of the tree trunk in that travel lane was the larger diameter portion of the tree near the base. So, and it, as I said, more than a foot wide there. So plan B gets set into motion. So let's take them across the driveway because I still have them just up at the driveway fence, but we haven't taken them across, but we're going to take them across the driveway and into the field instead of into the travel lane. Because remember the travel lane runs alongside of the field that's over there. And so hopefully then we could move them all the way down the field because that field has a gate where they could come out and come back up the travel lane from the other direction, uh, the same direction where they would come in from the back, from the back fields. Uh, that's down at the corner of the orchard. And so we could drive them up the travel lane from that direction. And so I'm hurrying into the field to open the gate. And as I approached the end down there where the gate is, lo and behold, another tree lay across the travel lane, smashing to bits the orchard fence. 
Um, these were big trees. They were living trees, you know, and it was it was hit and miss with which ones toppled over. I have no idea why these two particular trees fell and the others didn't, because the entire travel lane is lined with many trees um, inside the pasture. Of course, the travel lane's open, but just inside the pasture, many, many trees, the same size and, and relative condition. I mean, it's a it's a, a ravine there and there are trees just all over the place. And here are these two trees uh, out of all of those that were just kind of pushed over like bowling pins. So I immediately turn around and I'm heading back the way that I came and I'm heading off Scott with the cows because he is already trying to move the cows into the field. Um, so we move them back into the travel lane. And uh, I don't know, maybe half hour, 45 minutes has passed and now it is pouring rain. <laughs> The storm is back on us again. We we had three days of just pouring rain um, in the afternoons and, and, you know, booming thunderstorms and whatnot. So we're drenched and the tr the chainsaw is faulty. And so, so we're stuck at this point and we decided to take a break. We left the cows in the travel lane. We, they were just closed in there. Um, they were across the road. They couldn't go back across the road and they couldn't get into the field. They were just kind of in a, in a little area there where they could kind of mill about till we came back out. So we trudge back to the house to wait a little bit for the rain to subside, at least a little bit. So then we go to plan C and um, success. So on the second try, uh, after the rain let up, Scott chose to work on the smaller diameter tree that had crushed the orchard vent fence on the lower end of the travel lane. It was a little bit narrower there. And he was able to keep the chainsaw running enough to get a section cut out of the middle wide enough for the cows to pass, maybe six feet wide or so. Whew. We finally got the cows to the milking shed. I mean, it's starting to get dark at this point. And, uh, but things proceeded nicely from there. Um, only a couple of hours later than usual. I mean, Scott finished up with cleaning the equipment shortly after 10 PM. Um, dinner was really late and we got right back up again at six o'clock for the morning chores and the milking. And to assess the extent of the damage, we only saw just that little bit. Um, it was obvious there were more trees down. So after the storm assessment, there are still trees down everywhere. I mean, we'll, we will have plenty of firewood this winter. The tree with the bat house came down. It's on the, it's on the edge of the big pond. The bat house got smashed. Um... There are, I mean, there are trees down everywhere, but some of the significant ones, there are a bunch of trees across, I don't know, a bunch of them, uh, some trees that fell across the path. There's a pathway from field number 10 to field number 14, and we have the boys hanging out back there. Uh, the rams and the bucks, they were still in field number 10, but the steers and the bulls, they were trapped in 14. They were on the other side of that, uh, of the trees that were down. So either the chainsaw gets repaired and the trees cut apart and moved, or the fence had to be cut. So this is like Wednesday, the day after that storm. And Scott goes to town, takes the chainsaw in to be repaired, and uh, um, I think they were supposed to have it done by Friday, and then there wasn't anyone to do the repair on Friday, and so Saturday he finds out it's going to be a week or more because they had to order a apart. Big sigh. Uh, that means, I mean, we, we need to get the boys out of there. So the, the fence is going to have to be cut. It actually was cut. Um, one of the boys has an appointment at the meat processing plant on Tuesday and another has an appointment with butter and cloud. Um, so anyway, being creative, Scott cut the fence between two trees and he, he moved the steers and the bulls out of field 14 into field 11. Uh, that happened to be where he cut the field. And then he temporarily repaired the fence with some old downed branches and small trees just kind of woven in there so that they couldn't get past it. And that should hold him for the moment. Well, perhaps not the goats. You know, we shall see. He moved all the goats and the sheep over into 11 from 10 over into 11 as well. I don't know. They may get through, but they can also get back by the same path. I mean, you can't, you have to have really good fencing to keep goats in. <laughs> Uh, but they'll be fine. So those were Scott's most pressing issues. Mine was the internet. 
I do all of the the publishing, the newsletter, the all of the website updates, and uh, all of that stuff on the computer. I do all of that, and uh, so what happened there is at the start of the storm, there was a lightning strike that took out the DSL modem, my monitors, and later my network card actually stopped working also. So I'm sitting there minding my own business when the first peals of thunder can be heard. A mere five minutes or so later, a flash and an immediate boom right outside produced a pop and the smell of burning circuits just to the right of me. Uh, and this is not the first time we've lost a modem to lightning. This is the worst one. It not only traveled, it not only, it travels through the telephone wire into the modem. Um, and, you know, even though, even right through the surge protectors. And this time um, I have my computer, it has what's called a hardwire network connection into the modem. And so it traveled through that and that's what knocked out my network card and actually even uh, it must have been a spark inside the back of my computer that knocked out uh, my part of my graphics card. I have one monitor uh, of my two that are working. Anyway, it, it's not the first time that we've lost a modem to lightning. It's just the worst one. And, you know, that brief light and sound show let me know I should have stopped at the first sound of thunder and unplugged the phone line from the modem. I usually wait till it gets a little bit stronger, but there was only just a little bit of thunder and then pow, it's like the storm formed right on top of us. Um, so I have a spare modem and wireless router from the last incident, and so I hooked them up, uh, but there was no luck with the DSL. Um, so the home network is, is working because I have the router working, but the modem that connects to the internet for the DSL, that, that wouldn't connect. So I'm on the phone and I, uh, the phone still works and I opened a ticket with our internet provider kind of late on Tuesday afternoon before we went out for milking and I was assured it would be resolved by two or so on Thursday. So I'm like, oh gosh, because I was actually supposed to publish the newsletter on Tuesday night. So I knew that wasn't going to get done. Um, but I thought, okay, Thursday, I, I'll put it out on Thursday. So, um, around 5 PM on Thursday. It's still not up, and so I called and received an automated message, and that's when I learned there was an issue in the area that would be resolved by Friday, 7 a.m., and I'm like, okay, great. I, I can live with that. It's just the next morning at this point, and I even got a call at 8 o'clock on Friday morning. There was a message on my phone after we got back from milking that the issue was resolved. Well, wrong. At least for us, it was not resolved. You know, and we're three days now without internet at this point and no email. I've not got my newsletter done. I, I, I need to do some things for the, the herd share and so on. And oh, so I call again and uh, I find out my original appointment on Thursday because it's Friday now. Right. And uh, my original appointment on Thursday had been moved to a different date and time. Wednesday next week. Wednesday. I spent another hour on the phone trying trying to get it escalated. I mean, they did escalate it, but I didn't get any result. You know, I need my internet connection uh, to publish this podcast. Even, I mean, the agent was polite and he was helpful, but no luck. You know, the he kept talking with the repair schedulers, but they they wouldn't budge. They have the, it's nationwide and like this is the schedule this is you know this is when the earliest appointment is and there's no escalating it um, and they wouldn't give me the contact information for the local office so I could try and plead my case to the actual repairman um, so in the end I'm, I'm stuck with no internet for another four or five days um, so I'm recording this and I have no idea how I'm going to get it published it requires hours and hours of online time to get the audio post created to get the recipe created and to connect all of the details uh, to the various podcast distribution sites. Um, and I've contacted a neighbor that's offered assistance with internet, but I think I need to save that favor for just uploading the podcast after I get all of the other background work done. I'll probably do that at a public Wi-Fi location if I can. A lot of times you just don't have the real bandwidth in those locations there for, you know, doing a little bit of minor surfing of the net. Um, 
So it's been a rough week on the homestead around around here. Um, we like to be prepared for just about anything. And one saying we repeat often is two is one and one is none. And we only have one source for Internet. And when it's out, we have none. Um, there's no decent cell phone signal here, so I can't set up a Wi-Fi hotspot uh, with with the cell towers. Um that can't be a backup. So maybe you guys have some ideas on how we can come up with a backup internet. Um, let me know. Without getting a business line. A business line, they would have got out here and gotten it fixed right away. But those are really expensive. And we're just too small for that. So uh, let me know if you've got any ideas on that. Let's get on to the normal farm updates. So the herd shares, please let your friends and loved ones know about our herd share program. Raw milk and yogurt, raw, raw milk cream and butter, raw milk cheese. These are all available via, via our herd share program. You own the cow, you get the products from that cow. And if you're near Winston-Salem or Greensboro, North Carolina, we can serve your needs there as well. Just come to the farm, pick it up. Um... Contact me. I'll get you started on the path to healthy dairy consumption. Um, go to www.peacefulheartfarm.com. Select herd shares from the menu. You can also call us at 276-694-4369, 276-694-4369, or send an email to melanie at peacefulheartfarm.com, and we can start a conversation there. And uh, right now we are providing A2, A2 milk. And if you're not familiar with that, what that is, check out my previous podcast on A2A2 milk and why we drink raw milk. Uh, so you want to check out both of those. Click on the link in the show notes uh, or you can go to the website and select podcast from the menu and then you can listen to those podcasts. All right. You want to get in on that A2A2 milk. That's some that's some good stuff. Uh, the animals. So the breeding schedule for the cows has started. I briefly mentioned that uh, we're going to get uh, butter and cloud together with our Normandy built bull. We're still working out details of learning how to do artificial insemination. Um, and that project is currently delayed because we want to get what's called sexed semen. I have no idea how they do it, but they have narrowed the likelihood of having bulls with sexed semen. So you can have heifers. Um, it worked with butter. We bought her just 11 days before she calved and she had been artificially inseminated with sexed semen and it worked. She had a lovely little heifer. Um, and we really need some Normandy heifers. Um, the problem is the supplier for the Normandy semen tells us it may be several more weeks before we can get what we're looking for. Then you got to get the, get the cows in heat, get them, a. uh, uh uh, schedule for the AI and so uh, and so that's like moving way forward hence we're going to have butter butter's going to be bred with the Normandy bull that we have on hand uh, because it's important we have the calves in late March to early April so we've got to have at least ca one cow in milk for our herd shares and for cheese making so we want to have that available well before the first week of May and who knows maybe she will have another lovely little heifer <laughs> um but with the others, with our Normandies, we'll take no chances. We may be late getting them bred, but we're going to make sure that we have heifers this time. The sheep and the goats are all healthy and lively. Um, you know, with the storm and all the trees down, I was worried about trees falling on them and injuring them, but or them getting out or, or whatever. But uh, they're all safe and sound. Those fences and uh, are still quite intact. Now, the quail, who were born, I think, maybe seven weeks ago, They've started laying eggs, some of them. Uh, we tried some of them yesterday. They were delicious. Uh, it takes four little quail eggs to make one chicken sized, uh, chicken egg sized portion. Um, now, additionally, we, we've scheduled thinning out the quail roosters. There are three cages full of quail. There's eight in two of them and seven in the third one. Um, and so about half in each cage are male Interestingly, they, they seem to be pretty well divided. I haven't completely uh, identified all of them because they're always running around in there. But I think they're pretty evenly divided, you know, four and four, four and four. And then there's actually four uh, males and three females in the cage that has seven. 
Uh, so we're going to thin that down to one rooster to five hens. So we'll keep all the hens, but we'll we'll take out some of those roosters. That that's the end goal um, is to have one rooster to five hens. We'll see how close we can get to that number. Uh, and then in a few weeks, I'll begin gathering their eggs over a week's time uh, in preparation for incubating the second batch. And likely the second batch, hopefully anyway, we can fill out our breeding stock. So we want six sets of six birds. Uh, so that's one rooster and five hens in each of six cages. Um, so far, it's been easy raising quail. It's, a, it's great. <laughs> now, we did lose one bird to a snake. A week or so ago I think I forgot to mention that uh, in previous updates but it was necessary for me to enlist Scott's excellent help to get that snake out of the cage I wasn't gonna reach in there um, it was a harmless black snake a little small black snake uh, in one of the cages and one of the birds was dead I have no idea how it killed the bird um, there was no way it was gonna be able to eat it it was in there for the eggs but they weren't really laying any eggs at that time Anyway, Scott grabbed it with some pruning shears and pulled it out of the cage and snip. That was the end of that snake. Um, normally, we would leave a black snake alone as they eat mice and, and they're relatively harmless. However, this one was small enough to get in the cage and so he had to go. If we just moved him, he'd just come back. So earlier, a much larger one we, we moved. It was perched on one of the braces at the back of the cage. And uh, he got relocated. We haven't seen him since. But his head and body were far too wide to get through the half-inch hardware cloth that forms the cage. So I'm excited to see how this quail project progresses. It's a new adventure and, and so far has been a really fun one. Um, and they didn't seem to be affected at all by that storm. Scott did a great job on their shelters. All right, the garden and the orchard. The garden is producing peas, green peas. The potatoes have been dug. The early onions are ready. Oh, we've got tomato plants that are loading up. Um, we, we are going to do very well there with the tomatoes, I think. Then we have the dried beans, which are blooming and producing lots of bean pods. We have black beans, small red beans, um, and uh, a white kidney bean that we use. Uh, it's called a cannellini bean that we use uh, with escarole. I have a dish that I make with escarole that's fabulous. The red beans I use to make red beans and rice and of course black beans make uh, lovely uh, black beans when we have uh, Mexican cuisine. Um, so those dried beans, we'll just let those grow and grow and grow and then you leave them on the plant until they dry out. So that comes much later and you go pick them on, you know, and shell them all out once they're dried. Then I have a Mississippi silver cow pea, and those are coming along really nicely. Um, now, we eat those before they're dry. You can dry those as well. In fact, we will, so we have seed for next year. Um, but if you're not familiar, they're like black-eyed peas without the eye, and they're a little more rounded. Black-eyed peas are kind of somewhat oval. Um, these are almost completely round. Um, they're almost the same color as a black-eyed pea. This particular, it's, a, it's called a cow pea. Um, Mississippi silver cow peas and uh, they're great anyway um, we pick those after the peas have formed in the pods so they get shelled out of the pods but before they dry out so the peas are actually still green at that point a very pale green but they're still green and uh, we also pick a few that do not have the peas filled in and then those get snapped and put in with the shelled peas it's a wonderful wonderful dish and I can those as well so I was I was wishing I could do a recipe with that. But again, I'm, I'm not going to do a recipe today. Uh, we're getting blueberries out of the orchard and blackberries will be ready in a week or so. Yum, 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 yum. Um, I'm going to can both the blueberries and blackberries, uh, but not so much in jams and jellies because I have a lot of jams and jellies. I'm going to try my hand at making pie filling. And uh, it will be so handy to be able to just pull a jar out, pour it into the pie shell, and toss it in the oven. Yeah, your mouth's probably watering right now. I know mine is. Uh, fresh blueberry pie or blackberry pie. Mm. All right, the creamery. Now, <laughs> let me finally give an update on the creamery. 
Uh, with all of this craziness going on, uh, Scott's been hard-pressed to make any progress there. But he's persistent, and the walls are rising. He has spent the last few days out there, uh, even with all of the mess, the, the getting those walls put up. And he also makes cheese once a week, as do I. Um, it's a lot to fit into our days and weeks, but uh, we, we make it happen. It's a great life. Busy, busy, busy all the time. No time for boredom. No time for getting caught up in social media scandals and endless watching of television. We just don't have time. It took us three days, three tries to watch the movie Sherlock. It's the one with Robert Downey Jr. and Jude Law. An hour, sometimes less, and we are off to sleep. It's like, eh, let's watch more of this tomorrow. Let's watch it tomorrow. The rest of it tomorrow. And it actually took us three days. That happens quite often, actually. It's rare for us to watch a movie all the way through. All right, so that's it for for that. Now, there's going to be no recipe this week. I apologize for not providing a recipe this week. Due to the issues we're currently having with Internet access, I have opted to leave that part out of this week's episode. Um, It requires an additional hour and a half or so of Internet time, and that's when our high-speed connection is functioning. Um, as I mentioned earlier, my plan is to only impose a little on my neighbor for uploading the completed project. Um, but the hours and hours of pre-work on uh, setting up the post uh, will be done at a public Wi-Fi location. <laughs> Wish me luck there. All right, final thoughts. I mean, that's it for, for this week's Adventures on the Homestead. Next week, all will return to normal, right? <laughs> Not likely. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some new adventure that will arise. As I've said many times, we never get bored here. Life comes at us fast and furious. Sometimes as we kayak this river, we just move along with the current and try not to get too battered by the rocks and the rapids. If you enjoy this podcast, please hop over to Apple Podcasts, subscribe, give me a five-star rating and review. Also, please share it with your family and friends who might be interested in this type of content. As always, I'm here to help you taste the traditional touch. Thank you so much for stopping by the homestead. And until next time, may God fill your life with grace and peace.